Amen. Take your Bible and turn, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 3. I am uh, not sure how much that I'm going to get through this this morning. I'm, I don't know, something, something's wrong with me. I know there is. Because this message I've preached before, and I know that I've done it in one sermon. And for some reason now, I don't think I can do in one sermon what I used to do in one sermon. I think it takes me, I don't know, something must be wrong with me. It takes me longer now. I must be getting older, I guess, or wiser or something, I don't know, more foolish or what. But um, I, I've just been, uh, you know, just kind of moving through the book of Judges. And this is, the, this is where it takes us this morning. And there are some other things that I, I thought about preaching uh, based upon Judges chapter 3. There's several things here. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with something. And uh, if you've heard this before, then um, I want you to listen to it again because you'll need it. If you've never heard this before, I want it to be a blessing to you. Because God just literally, He saved my life and saved... Um, God, God protected me. God encouraged me. Um, God gave me a reason to get back up. Okay? He gave me a reason to get back up one day when I wasn't sure I was going to get up. There is, uh, let me put this on the screen. I know where this is going to end up. In uh, Micah chapter 7, look up there on the screen. Uh, the Bible says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Now I want you to think about that. Rejoice not against me, mine enemy. Because let me tell you something. When you get down, your enemies will show up. They're waiting for, they're waiting for you to stumble. They're waiting for you to fall. They have laid a trap for you to get you to fall. And when you get down there, they're going to rejoice over you. But you just keep this in mind. When you fall, you will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. You think about that, okay? Think about, in fact, think about it in this term, okay? Last night, we were driving home, and that sun was at our back. We was traveling, traveling east down Highway 44, and then all of a sudden, that sun was gone. That sun went down. This morning when I woke up, that sun came back up again. Now that's basically where I'm going with this. It happens every single day. Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man. Now what that means is, that man is justified before God. When God justifies you, he justifies you. Okay? Now he does not give you an excuse for sin. He does not give you a license to sin. I was told by uh, Brother Lonnie, and there's something, some things I'm going to be looking into. There is, a, there is a sort of a new, very, very evil doctrine going around, and it has affected some men that I know, some ministers that I know. And I have not heard about it before, but it basically is the idea that as a Christian, you can sin all you want to. And still be saved, still go to heaven. Everything's, it's all covered under grace. You don't have to worry about anything. That's a lie. That's a lie. Justification is not a, an excuse to go out and sin and do whatever you want to. If you're a child of God, God will put a stop to it real quick. He knows how. But a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. I want you to think about that. He fell once, and what happened? He got back up again. He fell again, what happened? He got back up again. A just man falls seven times. The wicked is different. The wicked shall fall into mischief. And it does not say here, then the wicked will get back up. Jim got happy on that one. Okay? It does not say the wicked will get back up. When the wicked falls, they stay there. They don't get back up. Now ponder this in your mind. Keep this in your mind. 
Because this is where we're going with this. See, he is happy. Now, Judges chapter 3, verse 1. These are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Even as many, and I, I want you to look at that phrase, to prove Israel. So I'm standing here in a church full of people. And I would like to think that all of us are justified before God. We're saved, born again. And that if one or another of us fall, we'll rise again. It's not that way in every church everywhere, is it? We know that there are fake, phony, they call themselves Christians, they may be somewhat Christian in a philosophy, but as far as Bible believers, as far as having the seal of the Holy Ghost in them, it's not so. I'm not their judge, you're not their judge, but they have deceived themselves. I preached a message yesterday morning on be not deceived. And what I did, Ryan, I, I wanted to do this for a long time, is just go through the Bible, all the places where the Bible tells you, be not deceived, be not deceived, be not deceived. Let no man deceive you. And one of the most troubling ways that a person can be lied to is when he deceives his own self. When a person deceives himself into thinking that he's right before God, when in truth he's not. He does not get that thinking from God's word. He gets it from his own mind. He invents it in his own mind that he's right before God, but the truth is he's not. And he could have known the truth, but he denied it. So people deceive themselves into thinking that they're right with God, but the truth is they're not. Those people, there's proof on who is and who isn't. There's proof. And God, we talked about this last week, God left people in the land of Israel, the Canaanites, the, the Hivites, and so on, that God told them to expel them out. They decided not to do that. And, and it was, if you, if you remember from Judges chapter 2, it was every tribe decided not to do that. They left some of the enemies in their own particular land. So whether it's one person this week not, not doing so well, Let's not, get, uh, let's not get arrogant over them. Let's not get cocky over them. Because next week it could be you or it could be me. Because we each own, have our own set of enemies to deal with. So, God left those nations there to prove them to see whether they would serve the Lord or not. The proof was that after they fell, did they rise back up again? That was the proof. After you fall, let's say that, let's say that when you die, where are you going to spend eternity? Are you going to rise back up in the resurrection? Or are you going to be like the rich man? Are you going to open your eyes being in hell? Being in torment? You see how that works? The just man falleth. And when I fall, I will rise again. When I die, I will be raised up in the resurrection and I will live in heaven. Or when you die, you will just keep going down. You'll go all the way to hell. So, the proof, there's going to be proof on who's right with God and who's not right with God. And that proof isn't for, for me to look out and say, okay, you know what? I knew they weren't saved. Eh, it's being shown that now. That's not my place. I don't sit here and look at my people or anybody who comes to my church saying, Boy, I hope they find out they're not really Christian. I don't want that. I preach and give the Word of God out because I want you to go to heaven when you die. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So we left them there to prove Israel by them, as, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. And that verse we read a while ago, when my, lest my enemies triumph over me, when I fall, I shall arise. Only, verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At the least, such as before knew nothing thereof. Namely, the five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites, 
and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Baal Hermon even, even unto the entering in of Hamath. In verse 4, they were there to prove Israel by them. And I want you to think about this. The proof that you're saved is not that you never fall. The proof that you're saved is, did you get back up when you stumbled? They were there to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Now turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. My testimony on this is, um, one day I was, uh, I was in the sanctuary here, and I was, I was down on my face before God, and I was just, I was bawling my eyes out. And this is many, many years ago. And I was very troubled over myself. And um, a lot of you know I grew up in this church. And I grew up just admiring church people, the adults that were here. And I had it in my mind that the grown-ups that were here were the, were the great godly saints that never did anything wrong, that never had any failures, never had any problems, never had any issues of life. You know, those are things that they don't just tell everybody, especially children in a church. So that was my idea of church people. And for a long time, as, you know, growing into an adult, in my mind I kept wondering when that was going to show up. When I was finally going to be the grown-up that never had any problems, never had any issues, never had any uh, serious dealings with God or anything like that. Never, had, never made mistakes, never had any failures, never committed sins, never done anything like that. I kept waiting for that to show up. And so I was down praying, and I was, I mean, I was crying. I was down. And I meant business with God. And it just seemed like the Holy Spirit was guiding me in my thoughts. And this idea of cycles came to me. And uh, I thought about it for a while, and I thought, well, you know, I need scripture. I need, I need Bible verses. And one day I was uh, sitting out, and I was looking out over a, a river, the big river. And I just sat out there, and I was just, me and God was talking, and I, and I was watching that river just flow. You know how rivers do. They just, they just keep on going. And it was like God said, Mike, what direction is that river going? And I knew what he was getting at. It was, it was like, you know, it wasn't east, west, north. It was rivers always flow down. Always. And they, they just flow downward. And I, watched, and I said, it's going downhill. And, and it will keep going down all the way till the big river, I guess, runs into, I don't know if it runs right into the Mississippi or the Merrimack or whatever, but anyway, it ends up in the Mississippi, Mississippi ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what God just kind of gave me this idea is that it's, it's getting lower all the time until it reaches a certain place. Then what's going to happen to it again? And so God just kind of put that in me again and gave me, gave me time to think about it. And then I went back and I, I was looking in the scripture and uh, this, I was, Ryan, I was, this was deer season and I was looking at this, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And uh, he said, vanity of vanities, this is verse 2 of Ecclesiastes, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Now, verse 4, one generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth 
forever. Just because someone dies, it, it literally is, when, when somebody passes away, we say to them, it's not the end of the world. And it really isn't. And we, we don't mean that in a harsh way. We, we mean that in saying, look, your life, even though this phase of your life is, is over with, it's not the end of your life. There are other things yet to live for. Just because this is past, there's something else that God is going to now going to do with you. We have, uh, Katerina, you just, I mean, you, you are part of this church. In that, we have several ladies here whose husbands have gone on to be with Jesus and left the, left the ladies here, okay? And... Uh, there's, I mean, there, you're sitting in a group. In fact, you're sitting on the side of the, uh, the widow side, looks like, okay? I mean, you're, they're surrounded you. It really isn't the end of the world. And it takes a while to figure that out. But you have a whole new life after that. I watched my mom. I watched my mom grieve. I watched my mom go through that process of missing her husband and uh, I'll never forget she told me she said I'm gonna have to go find a job I went oh mom not a job you know and uh, then she said that she got a position as a janitor at the Y and I'm going not cleaning toilets mom no no and I didn't want her to take that and I went over there to visit her one day because she was doing a little fundraiser over there, and mom was mom over there. If you know her, she was Judy Hoggard, reinvented. And you go to the YMCA, and you bring up my mother's name. They're going, oh, Judy, we know Judy, yeah, we love Judy. And I saw in her a new, she just new woman, got a new life ahead of her. She's not ready to turn toes up and just lay down and quit. She may have felt like it for a while, but it's not time. And so she was down, and now she's back up again. And that's what God does with us. We'll have downs and we'll have ups. One generation passes away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Now look at verse 5. The sun also riseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose happens every single day then the wind goeth toward the south turneth about unto the north it whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his look at that word circuits circuits and then verse 7 and I want you to think about this here's Solomon now this is 3,000 years ago Man's knowledge of his world and his universe is very, very limited. And yet Solomon knows how everything works in this world because God has given him wisdom that's far beyond anything. And Solomon knows what happens to all the water once it runs into the ocean. And, and we don't ever see water being picked up from the ocean and carried up into the atmosphere, do we? We never see it. So how did he know it? How did he know that where the clouds got their water from? God told him that because God made it this way. And now there's the key word there. God made it. When God creates something, when God makes it, it is this way. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. I want you to ponder that. Where the water started out, that's where they're going to end up again. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, turn to Psalm chapter 1. It's one of my favorite psalms in the whole Bible. Psalm chapter 1. I want you to look up there on the screen when you get Psalm 1. I've got a tree up there. And what you see there is, is an illustration of, of what this is about. Psalm chapter 1. You believe the Bible this morning. Say amen. Because it's going to help you. It's going to get you through. 
Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. How many of you would like a blessing today? Say amen. amen. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Sinners will not tell you what I'm going to tell you today. Lost people don't know this. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And I want you to look at verse 3. And he shall be like a what? A tree. He shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. What was it we were just looking at? Ecclesiastes. All the rivers run into the sea. God's connecting it here for you. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, there that they return again. He shall plant him, he shall be like a tree, planted by rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his what? Season. His leaf also shall not wither, whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. So I would like to ask you a question this morning. Would you like for your life to prosper? Now I don't mean that you gain a lot of money in this life. Who cares about that when you have grandkids? Amen. In fact, when you have grandkids, you have less money than you ever had before in your life. Amen. Amen. Okay. But it's, it's talking about life prospering. I would like for my life to count for something. I'd like for my life to mean something to my wife. I'd like for my life to mean something to my children. I'd like for my children to, to say dad was a good dad. I'd like for my grandchildren to say he had a lot of candy or whatever. I like people or whatever. I mean, I want that. I want my church to think that I'm worth something. That's what drives me. It's what compels me. I'd like for people to think, you know, he's, he may be like this in some ways, but I like, I like Mike. I like Brother Mike or whatever. That's what I want. I want my life to benefit the people around me in such a way as that I get to be a blessing to them. That, to me, is my idea of prospering. It's when you have, you have developed in your life, your character, the favor of other people, they like being around you, they like getting things from you and so on, that's where my blessing comes from. So I want my life to prosper and, and I, I ask God many times, God I want, I want to be a help, I want to be a blessing, I want to be an encouragement to people. But God, I need things in my life, I need help, I need to know how, to, how my life can be better, how I can be accounted as being a blessing for people, how, how can this... God, I would, and I read this one time, at, a t at probably about the same time I'm, I was going through this, I was looking at that and I was going, God, I'm, I'm withering and I'm not prospering. I'm not doing well. So God, what's wrong with your Bible? How come this is not working? How come this is not right? And, it, and I struggled with it for a long time. He said he shall bring forth his fruit in his season. And then when God pointed me to that, it clicked. It's seasonal. This time of year, there's pumpkins everywhere. Pumpkins are very seasonal. There are no spring pumpkins. There are no late June, mid-July pumpkins. They all come in the fall. In fact, they're usually just about the last thing that we can count on as far as producing fruit is concerned is the pumpkin. I was hearing something the other day that's talking about it, and they said pumpkins, actually, they kind of like this cold weather. It kind of beats them up there toward the end. You know, they don't like that long hot spell. They like cold falls and things like that. That's how they prosper. That's what they like. Before that, it was the apples. Before that, it was this. Before that, it was the other thing. But everything, and this is when it clicked in me, Mike, everything in your life has a season to it. It has a cycle to it. There will be cycles in your life, Mike, where... You will be prospering. There will be seasons in your life, Mike, where you're not prospering. But it's for a reason. It's for a, a time that is coming so that you can be. And what God was showing me was that everything, and you just stop and think about it. There are seasons, and the seasons are cycles. The sun rising and going down and hasteth back to where he started again. That is a cycle. 
The stars up in the sky, if you know anything about, if you know two stars up in the sky, can find two stars in the sky, then you know that the stars in the sky all have seasons and cycles. The stars that come out in the wintertime are not the same stars that you're going to see in the summertime. They're not the same. They have cycles. And the Farmer's Almanac has them all pegged down to just about exactly what time they're going to show up. Farmer's Almanac can tell what time the sun's going to, in fact, on my watch, on my Dick Tracy watch, it's got here 6.05 p.m. You know what that is? Sunset. It's going to be a different time tomorrow, different time the next day. They've got it pegged down. Why? Because God is consistent in what He does. They can measure what is going to happen by what has already happened. Now here's, here's the gist of it. Here's what I want to tell you. This is, and this is what we see in the book of Judges. You and your Christian, when you got saved, God initiated the cycle of your Christian life. The cycle of your Christian growth. Look up on that screen. You see that tree? Who can tell me, can you see in that tree when it was a yearling sapling, just barely a year old. Who can see that on that screen? You can see that, can't you, George? It's that dot right in the center of that. Now, the second year of that tree's life, I want you to look at that ring. There's a lot of rain that year. There was a lot. It looks like it more than doubled its size in a year, didn't it? And then look at that third ring. It looks like it did it again. The fourth ring. Now look at that fifth ring. I don't know if you can see it. But it's a little bit darker than the other rings. Can you see that? And it's skinnier. What does that mean? What does that mean, Caleb? There was not very much rain that year. It didn't grow as much. And it was leaner that year, and for some reason the, the, the wood ends up darker. Maybe it's, maybe it's a higher sugar content. What is it about grapes and rain? If there's not a lot of rain, does that mean the grapes are going to be sweeter? There's less water and more sugar. So these wines that are sweeter than others come from grapes where there wasn't a lot of rain that year and they're just, listen to that. Even in the lean years, sometimes, who in here remembers as a child growing up poor? You know, I used to hear my grandmother talk. Now, maybe not everybody has this story, but I used to hear my grandmother talk about when she was growing up, they didn't have anything. But she did not talk about those years with disdain and hatred. To her, they were some of the sweetest memories that she ever had. Think about times in life as a Christian when you were not doing well. Maybe the, maybe the year was lean for you. And when you look back on it, it seems like God does some of the most sweet, blessed things in your life at that time. Is that making sense to everybody? Okay? Your life is this tree. Now he said there in Psalm, he said, He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. What can we expect out of a tree planted by rivers of water? It's always going to have access to what it needs. And as it grows, here's what we know about people who just come to the Lord. They're like that, that first year sapling. Okay? And God designs a new tree to be able to bend very well. Amen? And it needs that because the hard winds are going to blow and try to blow it over. It needs to be able to bend a lot. Because its roots are not very deep. But as we grow in the Lord, every year a new ring, every year a new cycle, 
Every year, a new thing that God, a different thing that God is going to do, and yet it's, it's, he's consistent in what he's doing in our life, that every year we grow more in the Lord, and we add another ring to ourselves, and another year older in Christ, we're a lot more stern about issues of life, and we're harder for the wind to push over. We don't bend very well, but we're rooted very, very well. You understand that? Who in here wants to go to heaven when they die? And the devil doesn't want that out of you. He wants to try to destroy you by causing you to stop where you are, fall, and not get up again. That's what he wants. So all those stupid things that you did a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, or an hour ago, those are all things that's part of the cycles of growth. There's going to be times when you're down. There's going to be times when you're up. There's going to be times when your leaves are out there. We're, we're entering into a time right now. See the leaves? They're going to be gone in about two weeks. The cold weather, that frost is hit, and those leaves are going. They're going to fall very quickly. Now, it's going to look pretty while it happens, but then we've got to endure, what, four or five months of looking at bare, naked trees. There's no growth. There's, no, there's nothing there for them. But it's all part of it. You had to go to sleep last night, didn't you? Why, you should have stayed working for the Lord all night long, shouldn't you? No, even Jesus had to rest, amen? I come home last night, I was a little tired. I worked on this for a while and worked on some other things. And I went to bed and got my rest. Got up and ready this morning, I'm ready to go. And this is just this is this is your life. This is how it works right here. So let me run through this. Very, let me show you this. In Judges chapter three. I don't know how far I'm going to get with this. It's already after twelve. But I'm just going to lay the foundation for you today. How's that? Judges chapter three. The Lord and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the groves. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and He sold them into hand of. Chushan Rishantheim. I looked that I looked that name up. That's a twenty dollar name right there. You know what that name means? Chushan, the twice wicked one. I did. That's what it means. The twi That's who God sold them into the hands of. God put them in the darkness of cruel authority. He put them in the dark by having them held in bondage. Have you ever felt like you were in bondage? Even as a Christian. And what? here's what's going to happen. You're going to have these people tell you, well, you're a Christian, you should never be this way. Don't listen to that. It's not real. There are people who want you to think that you're supposed to live this high, sus uh, sustaining, prosperous time that never fails and never has any weaknesses and never, never is brought low and is never brought under anything. That is a, that's a setup for failure. Because when it doesn't happen, you will think, well, obviously this Christian thing is not for me. And you'll buzz out. You won't be here anymore. God put them under the hand of a cruel Lord, twice wicked Lord. But then what happened? Verse 9. When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Who in here has ever done that? The Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So then they were like that for a while, and the land had rest 40 years. Verse 11. And then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. So Moab was subdued that day under the, that's verse 30, under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest fourscore years. That's 80 years. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew the Philistines, 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. 
Now look at chapter 4, verse 1. And when the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harasheth of the Gentile. So far we've seen Israel on top because God sent them a deliverer, and the land had rest, and their rest brought prosperity, and their righteousness brought blessing, and they were blessed, and then their blessing and the prosperity brought laziness. You know how it goes. It's not when things are going good that we pray. It's when things are going not well. It's not when things are right that we have this, man, I need church. It's when usually things are not right and not well. And finally it hits us, I need to be back in the house of the Lord. So then what happens is, and this is what happened with Israel. They, they, got, they got blessed, they got lazy, and then lazy turned. All, all of a sudden now iniquity shows back up, and iniquity always chooses the God that's going to worship. And your iniquity will never choose the God of heaven. It will always choose a lesser God to worship. So they start worshiping a lesser God. And God put them, when God saw that, God puts them under the hand of cruel authority. And they're under cruel authority for a while. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, they cry out to God. And God is ever faithful. God didn't just say, forget it. I've done this once already. I'm not doing this again. God is all about these cycles. The sun went down yesterday. God didn't say, you know what? I've done, I've done that sunrise so many times. I'm sick of it. I'm not having a sunrise ever again. Then he's a liar. He's a liar because Jesus is going to come up as the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So the sun comes back up again. God hears the cry of his people. His people cry out. God hears their cry. He feels sorry for them. He repents him of what he's done. He sends a deliverer. And these guys, I mean, look at this, uh, look at this Shamgar, the son of Anna. 600 Philistine men, he had an ox goad. You know what that is? It's a poker that you get oxen to get them out of the way. Move these oxen on. He had one of those in his hand. 600 Philistines. He makes uh, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan look like he's still got training pants on. Amen? Takes an ox goat after him, kills 600 men. God put it in that man to deliver those people. And they, they, they were delivered. Now they're back up here. But then, as soon as he's dead, children of Israel did evil again in the sight of, of the Lord. Now watch this. Judges chapter 4, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. How long did it take you to get saved? It would take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. <laughs> Judges chapter 6, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian seven years. Verse 7, It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, brought you forth out of the house of bondage. So God gave them Gideon. And now, Judges 8, now Gideon's dead. It came, came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Berith their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Don't tell me that you have never forgotten who God was and what He did. Because we do. When things are going well, when we're prospering, when everything's right, we seem to forget God and who He is and what He's done. And we get right back in it. But something's happening. These cycles, they are repetitive, but they're purposely repetitive. Because with every one of these cycles, we are growing. And with every one of them, we're getting a little bit stronger. Our knowledge of the Bible are the roots that are drawing just a little bit deeper down into the earth. And you see what happens. When a, when a young Christian has these troubles, 
they don't have a lot of scripture in their heart to thrive on, do they? And yet somebody that's, that's really serving God and they understand how this works, that when the lean years come, when winter time sets in, they've got a, their root system is far deeper than the young sapling. They're more stern. They're more hard to deal with. But the root system is deep. And even in the lean times, they use that to reach down, far down in places where the water still is, to draw from that, to keep going when other peoples would have fallen out a long time ago. Does that make sense to everybody? You are that tree. You go in those cycles. Judges chapter 10. And after Abimelech, there, there, there arose to defend Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And then in Judges uh, 10 verse 5, And Jair died and was buried in Cayman. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. And what happened? I mean, you just see that. You go through the book of Judges. And I'm not even... If you read and study the book of Judges in your own, you will see this. And I know that from Moses to Samuel, there were 17 judges. So excluding Moses and Samuel, that would leave 15 judges in the book of Judges. Which means that 15 times, 15 times, the Israelites went in those same cycles. They served God. God blessed them. They got rich. They got wealthy. They got lazy. They got sinful. They turned their back. They forgot God. God put them under cruel authority. They were down low. They cried to God. God brought them back up again, gave, brought them a savior, brought them a judge to lift them back up again. And they survived in the promised land from the time that Joshua led them in, really until the time that, that Nebuchadnezzar took them into Babylonian captivity. Now God has set aside those cycles for Israel, but he has now instituted those for our life right here, right now. And I'm not going to keep going with this next Sunday if the Lord allows me. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe God will give me something else. Maybe God just wanted to get this out to you today. That if you are down here and you're a child of God, think back on where you used to be. Because you didn't used to be down here, did you? You used to be up here, didn't you? Who brought you there? God brought you there. He put you up there. And if you're down here, could God have left you up here? Yes. But it wouldn't have served a purpose. Because every... I'm going to ask our guys that play video games. Who plays video games? Look at him. He, you should, he jumped out of his pew to raise his hand. So everybody's going to look at you. So when you play video games, the first time you get a brand new game and you play it, the first time you start going through, you get shot and killed by the zombies. Right? Right? You never, nobody ever makes it to round two without being shot and killed first. At least a half dozen times, right? Right? After you play round one so many times, you figure out where they're all coming from, right? So then you make it to round two. Round two is a whole different neighborhood, isn't it? So you play round two. And the first time you play round two, what happens? The zombies kill you. And it takes a while playing round two before you can get to round three, doesn't it? Have you ever made it to the very end of one of these video games? Cameron has? Well, Cameron's our guy then. Cameron's going to stand up and tell us how it works. Right? 
But see, that's how it is. The more you deal with these enemies that you've got down here, the more you learn how to fight them off. And God doesn't unleash them all on you all at once, does he? No, little by little. Because if you go back and read what I just said, little by little and little, that is exactly how he said he was going to remove the enemies out of that land, is it not? He didn't say he was going to get rid of them all at once, all in one day. He said by little and little. That means you're down here, you're going to fight them off for a while, and God's going to raise you back up and give you some rest. Because we have to rest in between the fights, don't we? And then round two, and we're going to fight them a little bit more down here, and then back up, and then down again, and back up. And your life is, somebody asked me when I was teaching this, they asked me, they said, is there anybody in Christianity that this does not apply? And I said, no, it doesn't. It's, every, it's the preachers, and it's the pew people. It is everybody. If anybody tells you different, you, said, you tell them I said they're a liar. You tell them God's word said they're a liar. Because if you remember back, before you were back up high here, you weren't there, were you? Where were you, Lynn? Grieving over your husband. You've had these cycles, haven't you? They come in waves. And the first couple days after that, it was hard to deal with. But the waves decided, and God gave you rest from grieving. But the second wave that came, it wasn't quite as bad as the first wave. And then God gave you rest again. The third wave that came wasn't as bad as the first one. And then God gave you rest again. And every now and then, over time, it gets a little better every day. Say amen. I'm telling you, you're in this cycle now, and it's winter time, and you don't think you're going to ever make it out. God's never failed for springtime. He's never failed to bring the sun back up again. And he's never failed to bring a Christian back up here where they need to be. He's never failed it. And he's not going to fail you. Okay? I want you to bow your head. And I'm just going to close this out. I want to, I want to give you a time to think about this and meditate on it. And I want you to think about that water cycle. I want you to think about that tree. Think about your life. Think about where you were. Think about where you are now. And for a while, I had it in my mind that God was going to just hang me out to dry one day. And God's never done that with anybody. And He's not going to do it with you. I promise you, God will do it for me. He'll do it for anybody. But if you're down low today, whether you're sitting here, you're watching online, I want you to remember that you didn't used to be there. And when you start asking what happened, just remember, the season came around for you to be down. And just as sure as that happened, the season's going to come back around for you to be back up again. And every time that happens, God's going to make you wiser. He's going to make you stronger. He's going to make you happier overall. He's going to sustain you through these cycles. And He is going to prove you. He's going to prove you. And you're going to get to a point in your life, in your walk, where there's not ever going to be any question about whether you're going to heaven or not. Never. Because you understand this is how he works. Father in heaven, if you had me preach this for one person today, then Lord, so be it. And Lord, I thank you so much for this. I thank you, Lord, for giving it to me. Lord, at a time I needed it, I needed it bad. 
And I thank you, God, for strengthening me over the years and causing me to understand, Lord, that when things are not so well with me or things are not so well maybe in my family or things are not so well in the church or in the country, that you'll bring things back around again. The sun will come back up. Springtime will come back around. Things will pop out again because that's who you are. You're the God of cycles. Everything in this creation that you made operates on cycles, God. And Father, we thank you for that. We ask you, God, Lord, to minister, Lord, to those that are need ministering. Father, if there's someone here, the Lord, this morning where they're just, boy, they're just up and doing well, and Lord, remind them that they're not going to stay that way. You will, of necessity, bring them back down because that's where they need to be sometime. So, Father, Lord, just encourage us with this. Remind us, dear God, of this wonderful, wonderful thing that you have in your Bible. Lord, let it be a blessing, Lord, as we share this with other people who are struggling in their lives, Lord. That when we fall, we do rise back up. Thank you, God, Lord, for this. I pray, dear God, it would be a blessing. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless whatever effort, Lord, and whatever, however, Lord, this came out. I pray, God, that you would make it a blessing to somebody who needed it today. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.